say thank you for your mercies, your tender kindness and your love. Thank you for what you do in our midst, what you're about to do. I pray, Lord, as about to minister the word, your, the word of God tonight, I pray you are quicken it, make it real and fresh to everyone tonight. Let a fresh anointing rest upon everyone to hear your word, receive your word, and I pray you help us to be truly doers of word. Give us all understanding, give us insight, revelation knowledge, let it flow. And I commit the ministry of the Word of God into your hands and Holy Spirit. I thank you. You're always confirming the Word of God with signs, wonders, and miracles. So take full control. Yes, and I give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you please turn with me in your Bibles tonight? Um, we're going to start off in 2 Peter chapter 1. And then when you finish, there, go to, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 23. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. So, Trish, you got your Bibles out? It's Bible study, so we'll look at several scriptures. And you can follow me as we go through. And so we're going to start off in 2 Peter, uh, chapter 1. I'm going to go to verse 20. And when, you've, when you're there, then keep your finger at Leviticus chapter 23. This uh, Friday night, begins uh, the Feast of Trumpets. And the Feast of Trumpets will, um, it's all day Saturday. And, and you know, if you know how God's timing is, it goes from evening to evening. So from Friday evening all the way through to Saturday evening will be um, the Feast of Trumpets. We're just days away. And it's an important feast. All of God's feasts are important. And therefore, we should not let them just come and go without us being aware or preparing ourselves mentally, spiritually um, for it. All right? So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Peter, the apostle, writes, knowing this first. So he says, this is the first thing. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So nobody has a license to go and take the scriptures and put their own spin on it. You know that it takes more than one scripture verse to make a doctrine. And some people build a doctrine just around one scripture verse to suit their needs, and that's not the way it works. As you know, when it comes to a doctrine, a doctrine is if all the scriptures pertaining to a subject, taking a look at it and see what it says, and you can see, okay, this is what this particular doctrine is about. I'm not going to minister a doctrine to you tonight. That's not it. But the scripture is telling us that no scripture is of any private interpretation, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So when we look at Scripture, we've got to look at the Scripture whole to understand what the Word of God is saying. Mm -hmm. And that means Old Testament. I know some people don't like reading the Old Testament, but it, and the New Testament too. You've got to look at both, whole, the whole counsel of what God has to say. I know some Christians, say, all they want to do is hang out in the New Testament. That's great to talk about the New Covenant, but you've got to look at the Old. Remember, if it wasn't for the Old, the New wouldn't, come up, wouldn't be in place. Mm -hmm. And the Old lays the foundation the New Testament sits on top of it. If the new was first, then it would have come first, but it didn't. So we always got to look at the whole counsel of God from the beginning of Genesis, from the first verse, all the way to the last verse in the book of Revelation to, to know, to, to understand something. So tonight we're talking about the Feast of Trumpets coming up. Um, Leviticus chapter 23. Um, I won't jump right away into it because I don't know if there's anybody listening to us who may not be aware of all these truths, which I know most of you, we've, we've, you've heard this in the past. I mean, talking about feasts and all that kind of stuff. So let's just look at some scriptures first. Because some people say that as a Christian, you shouldn't be concerned about the feasts, the biblical feasts, because it all belongs to Jews. 
Well, I'm going to tell you something. You, in the scriptures, if you read it very carefully, the Bible is very clear. The feasts don't belong to Gentiles. They don't belong to the Jews. They're God's feasts. And therefore, because they're God's feasts, we should, we should be uh, aware of what they're about and, 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 and understand what it's about and um, partake. Because, because another word for feast or words is God's appointed time. So in Leviticus chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 1 to 4. You can follow with me. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord. Whose feast is it? The Lord's. The Lord's, right? Okay, so don't let anybody hoodwink you and say, Oh, you don't need to be doing that. It's the feast of the Jews. No. The feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Now, you remember the Hebrew word from this Hebrew, from this word, where we get the word convocation, it, it's implying like a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. A what? A rehearsal, right? Even these are my feasts. Again, God says again in the second, again, he said, he said, they're my feasts. All right? So don't, let's not forget that. Six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation, I guess. Again, another rehearsal, right? So he's saying that, um, that the seventh day is a feast from his perspective. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. He's speaking to his people. Now, let me pause there for a moment. Some, some Christians get all hung up on this, whether should we keep the Sabbath or not. The purpose of this Bible study is not about that. But let me just say this, from a New Testament point of view, if you don't want to keep the Sabbath, that's up to you. You're free. God gave this as a covenant, as a gift to the Jewish people, to holy people. Guess what? As a born-again believer, God considers you holy because he says you're a royal priesthood, you belong to the kingdom, you're, you're kings, that's how he sees us, right? As saints. He sees us as, if you're a born-again Christian, you are also considered holy. The gift is yours if you want it. It's if you want it. In other words, if you want to embrace honoring God on the Sabbath and enter into it and see all the blessings that God has for you, guess what? You can. And if you choose not to, well, nobody's going to hold it against you because it's not doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. Amen. Amen? So anytime you don't want to honor God on that day or parts of that day you don't want to honor, that's, that's your business, right? Nobody's going to hold... Don't let anybody hold you to it or feel guilty or bad because you decided I'm going to go do something else on that day. That's your choice. All right. Okay. So he gave it to his people who are holy people. As members of the body of Christ, you are also holy. And also you can enter in if you choose to or you can say, no, it's your choice. Right. Okay. So that's as much as I'll say right now on that. Because again, the purpose is not about that. But it's telling you about his feast. And in, and, in, and in verse 4, it says, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in your seasons. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Which ye shall proclaim in your seasons. Now, this word feast comes from a Hebrew word, moed, which means appointments. Okay? So the English transliteration for moed is M-O-E-D. Right? But if you look at the Hebrew, you see the Hebrew characters. All right? It means what? It means appointments. It means God's appointments. It means appointed times to meet with God. God has a season when he, 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 he's got a calendar when he wants his people to meet with him. And his, his appointments, his calendar, if you want to call it God's calendar, I like to call it that, was set long before he created the earth. Glory yeah. to God. Long before he started creating, before he created man. He had a set time. Glory to God, to, to, to meet with his creation. And, and he shared these, tr these, these uh, truths with his people, and we have it in the Bible. If you want to enter in, it's your choice. Again, you don't have to if you don't want to, right? All right? So um, the word feast carries the idea, the thought to keep an appointment. All right? Okay? So... Um, God made appointments with his covenanted people, those who he's entered into a covenant relationship with. And if you're a born again individual, I mean, you've been born from above, the blood of Jesus washed your sins away. You are in covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ. 
and he wants to meet with his people at certain times in the calendar year. Yeah. All right? Like, started off, the, the, the most frequent one is every Saturday, a Sabbath. All right? And um, so there are specific days, times, when God wants to meet with his people, and he's, he's telling his people, I want you to observe these times. So if you look at verse 5, real quickly, verse 5 talks about Passover. It, this is what it says. In the 14th day of the first month, even the Lord's Passover. That's, that's a feast. And we know that goes for, what, seven days, right? Yes. Okay? Then, I mean, the, the whole thing for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But it's telling you that's, that, that is a feast. Then it tells us in, in um, verse 6, if you look at it, it talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay? And, and if you read carefully that, that's the one that really goes for seven days. So Passover, then Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? Sometimes we use these words interchangeable. But the whole season for Passover is it's really seven days, right? Okay, and then within that, you see in verse 10, um, he said, speak unto the children of Israel, and say to them, you, you know, uh, well, I'm, you, you can finish reading the rest of the verse for yourself, but it's talking about first fruits, okay? So, um, and, we, and we know from Scripture, from the New Testament, that three days later, three nights later, after Jesus was crucified, he rose again from the dead, he was the first fruit. Okay, he did fulfill that, all right? And then we see in verse 16, it talks about uh, Pentecost. We all know what happened on the day of Pentecost, right? He's talking about his feast, all right? So um, over 3,500 years ago, God set, the, he's appointed holidays called feasts um, to be observed forever. Hallelujah. And, and the principle is set that way. He said, whoa, is it forever really, Pastor Paul? I thought that was back in the Old Testament. Well, let's go to verse 14. Verse 14 of, of this uh, same chapter, sorry, uh, um, Leviticus chapter 23, um, verse 14, the latter part of that verse, it says here, it shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. All right? There are other scriptures to support that. Um, you'll see um, the fifth feast that uh, um, God talks about is called the Feast of Trumpets. So if you go with me to verse 23, it says here, that's the one that's coming up this Friday night, all day Saturday. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall, be, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. All right? So it's a Sabbath. Okay? It's, it's a memorial of blowing of trumpets, which, which we call the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, so there's something, God wants this day to be remembered for some reason. He said it's a memorial of blowing of trumpets. Hallelujah. And it's a holy convocation. So again, it's, it's going to be like a rehearsal, right? And, and, and he said, he goes on verse 25, he said, Ye shall do no civil work therein, ye sh but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, we won't talk about these other two right now, but verse 27 talks about the Day of Atonement. That has to do with redemption. I just, by, by the way, let me back up again. Feast of Trumpets has to do with one of the, it has to do with repentance, okay? It's a call to repentance, all right? Um, there's more to it, but it, it's, it's known for that. When you see David Thomas, it's, it's known for redemption. And, um, and then you'll see in verse 34, it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when you said that the Jews were called to set up the, uh, the, the booth, the Sukkot, right? And, and that speaks of a time of rejoicing, all right? Um, so one may say to us, well, why are they important to us today from a believer's point of view? Why are they? Well, Colossians, go with me, Colossians chapter 2, New, New Testament talks about that, all right? Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 16, well, you'll find it, I'm just going to read because of time. He says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of and holy day, or of the new moon. By the way, Feast of Trumpets is a new moon. Mm -hmm. 
all right okay or in fact it's the only feast that is on a new moon which is kind of interesting okay so or of the new moon or of the sabbath days verse 17 says which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of Christ. So it's telling us all these feasts that God talks about in Leviticus chapter 23. Again, also you'll find them in Exodus chapter 23. All the biblical feasts that God talks about, the, the weekly feast Saturday, Sabbath, mm -hmm. the Passover, uh, feast, uh, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, feast of trumpets, day of atonement, and feast of uh, tabernacles, they're all a shadow of things to come. Praise God. Uh, hallelujah. Yes. That's what the Bible tells us. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and notice how it says in that, in that latter part of that verse, in verse 17, it says, but the body is of Christ, mm -hmm. which, which means these holy days are a shadow or a type mm -hmm. of a future event. So when it comes to when it talks about, but the body or the completeness of these feasts will be fulfilled by Christ. That's what, what that latter part of that verse is, 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 is implying. It's telling us. But the body is of Christ. In other words, the completeness of these feasts will be fulfilled in Christ. In other words, he will fulfill every one of them. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. So these... Um, these feasts, these holy holidays, you can see where you get the word holiday from a holy day, right? Um, these, these, these feast holidays were only representative or representative, <laughs> sorry for, for my words, but they represented a future event, okay, um, that would come. It, it's symbolic, all right, which will be fulfilled in Christ, all right, and so, what Paul the Apostle is saying here in these scriptures we just read, he's saying they'll find the ultimate fulfillment by Christ in the future. And we know that uh, Passover, Christ fulfilled that. He was the Lamb of God. John said, behold the Lamb of God. And he's the one that went to the, to, to the cross. He's the one that laid down his life. He's the one that went allowed himself to be slaughtered like a sheep that was dumb before the shears, right? Or what the scripture says. I mean, he is the Lamb of God. Jesus, he fulfilled that. Yeah. Um, he fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread, yeah. all right? Because he was put in the grave at the, just before Feast of Unleavened Bread started. Yeah. And um, the scripture, and we all, if you know anything about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Jews were to eat no yeast in their food for seven days, mm -hmm. right? And yeast is a type that speaks of sin, corruption, pollution, right? And the Bible says Jesus prophesied that, um, well, no, sorry, the Word of God prophesied about the death of Jesus, that his body will see no corruption. Amen. And three days, three nights later, when Jesus rose again from the dead, he did not, his body did not see corruption. So he fulfilled that. When he rose again from the dead on the first day of the week, which is known as first fruits, Jesus fulfilled that. We know that 50 days later, when Pentecost came along, Jesus fulfilled that because he said that it's important that he goes away and he's going to ask God the Father to send the Holy Spirit. And it was a day of outpouring of the Holy Spirit, so he fulfilled that. So those first four feasts have been fulfilled, right? And does it mean that God has nothing to do with those anymore? Absolutely. This, again, if you understand the scriptures, they are going to be eternal. They're going to be ongoing. Uh, they're not going away. All right? As a Gentile believer, you have an option whether you want to observe them or not. If you do choose to, you're going to enter into some blessings that you wouldn't have otherwise experienced. But it's not going to, it's not going to, by choosing not to participate or observe or partake in any of these feasts, it, it's not going to affect your salvation. All right, so just 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 let you understand it, so nobody gets religious <laughs> on this. All right, uh, Hebrews chapter ten verse one tells us, it says, "For the law having a shadow of good things to come." There's that word shadow, okay? Yes. Again, and not the very image of the things can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So again, 
These were all shadows and types, and that was the intent. Hallelujah. If you're looking for scriptures, for some of the scriptures, again, this is not the focus of the Bible study about Jesus fulfilling these. Uh, the, the, these feasts, uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, Jesus is our Passover. Uh, uh, Jesus is our unleavened bread. You find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. How do we know that? The scripture says, For he has, he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of him. Okay? Uh, Jesus is our first fruits. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Pentecost. How about that one? You'll find it in John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39. Okay? Remember when Jesus spoke about that he that believes on him, as the scripture says, has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of what? Living water. All right? And in verse 39, in brackets, it says, But this spake he of the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So you can see all these scriptures pointing that Jesus fulfilled them. Again, if we had time, we could go into more scriptures to, 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 to support all of them. Okay, so, so, so that you know that the Feast of Trumpets is also known as Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a Hebrew word for head of the year. All right? Um, but it's interesting, you won't find Rosh Hashanah in the Bible. You'll find Feast of Trumpets in the Bible, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. All right? Okay? And nevertheless, the, the, these words are, are used um, so that you know it's the same thing. Uh, and same time period, and that God gave to the nation of Israel. And um, uh, glory to God. So Rosh Hashanah means, again, head of the year or the beginning of the year. So in the Jewish calendar, they've got two calendars, one a civic calendar and a religious calendar. The religious calendar is like back uh, when Passover started, the first month, um, the first of Nisan, or, you know, and um, that's a religious calendar. And they have a civic calendar which starts the first of, of the seventh month, also known as Tishri. All right? So um, this particular feast uh, it, it is when the trumpets are blown. Now, the Hebrew word for them is used shofar, when the shofars are blown. And, um, and they blow them a lot. In fact, 30 days before the Feast of Trumpets, the, uh, the religious Jewish people are blowing the shofar every day. So by the time they come to uh, the day of Feast of Trumpet, it'll be like 30 days, and then they'll blow for, uh, and then there'll be another 10 days leading up to make it 40 for Day of Atonement. All right? And it, it, it's all about a call to repentance. It, it's like, and, and we know a shofar blast, a trumpet blast, it, it's so powerful, it has the power when, it, when it's God's trumpet to, to wake up the dead, amen, <laughs> which one of these days it will, hallelujah, and, um, and to wake up the sleepy Christians, yes, um, it, to bring life, all that sort of stuff. But all this first started, the Jewish people um, uh, get their uh, scriptures and their understanding of, of all this way back when, when Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. Amen. Do you remember that story? Yes. And what's interesting about it, and the King James says that Abraham, he calls Isaac a lad, you know, and in English a lad is like a little boy or, or whatever, but when you read the scriptures carefully, Isaac was not a little boy. Um, he he, he he, 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 he was well fully aware of what was going on. He was not a little kid, believe me. Um, he willingly laid down his life and understood what was going to happen. And Isaac is a type like Jesus. God. Jesus, when you read the scriptures, willingly laid down his life for you and me. Amen. No one could have taken Jesus' life if he did not allow them to. Amen. And so... So because Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son, he's really his only son between him and Sarah, who was willing to do that because he was in covenant relationship with God, God was now obligated to 
willing to give up his son. God is not interested in human sacrifice, but God just wanted to test his obedience. All right? And Abraham was persuaded by faith, if you read it very carefully, he was so convinced of what God said that even if he had killed Isaac, that God would raise him from the dead. Amen. Hallelujah. So as he raised the knife to bring it down on Isaac, God, through his angel, interrupted Abraham from killing him. Right? So, um, it is believed, um, the, the, the Jewish people believe it was at this time, Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, whichever way you want to use, that was when Isaac was offered. Right? So if you, again, if you know the story, um, after when God interrupted Abraham, God provided a sacrifice. And there was a ram caught in a thicket. You could go back to Genesis, um, I believe it's 22, somewhere around there. You can read the story. Right? Um, you will have to do that on your own. And there was a ram caught in a thicket, and God did provide a sacrifice. And Abraham took that and sacrificed the lamb. From the horns that came from the ram, we have the shofar. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So you can see the two are tied together very much. All right? Um, so um, the Jews believe um, that, that when the shofar is blown, at, you know, at this time that God hears the sound of the shofar, and he leaves his seed of judgment and goes to the seed of forgiveness, of mercy. Which is kind of interesting, right? Um, I'm just telling you what they believe. I, I, I don't know if that's what God does. Maybe he does. I know they have some insight to the scriptures that we don't or we haven't. But, it, it, you know, so this is what they believe. The second thing that they believe, which is kind of interesting, um, is that they believe in a future coming of the Messiah, which is interesting, and the regathering of Israel back to the homeland. And you'll see um, kind of in Isaiah chapter 27, it talks about the regathering, you know. Um, I'm just going to just read this verse to you. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13, it says here, and it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown. Interesting. And they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and, out, and outcast of the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So we know from scriptures when the, when the shofar, the trumpet is blown, often it's for an in, in gathering. Okay, And if you would read Numbers chapter 10, it talks about um, God told Moses to make two silver trumpets. He says, um, he told them what, you know, when a certain blast is made, it means that only the leaders were to come to the tabernacle. Uh, or when a, a, another blast was made, it meant the whole congregation was to pack up, get ready, you're moving out. Yeah. You know, they, they were gathered together, it says, whatever you're doing, you stop doing, you listen to the sound of the trumpets, right? Okay, so... Um, during the Feast of uh, Trumpets, um, on that day, um, Psalm 47, I would encourage you to read it, is recited at least seven times throughout that day. And um, this, this is what they do. And, you know, and, it's, and they go from there. So, what's significant about this? Well... Again, as I was telling you, in Genesis chapter 22, it, it ties back to Isaac. It ties back to the ram. It ties back to the, to the horn that, from the sacrificial lamb that came. And therefore, when the shofar is blown, we know that it's the voice of the Lord in the earth. Things happen when the shofars are blown, right? And we can see also in the scriptures, particularly the Old Testament, when the shofar was blown or the trumpets, were, I'll say the shofars were blown, um, miracles took place. The miracles took place. Look at the priests that marched around Jericho. Yeah. I mean, the walls came down. Amen? Yeah. And, the, you know, Gideon, remember him? Um, uh, had a small army of 300, plus himself. And, and the blowing of the shofar, the smashing of the, of the, of the, of the lanterns, the, the, the bottles that they had in their hands. 
just caused confusion in the camp of the enemy and God brought victory by the blowing of the shofar. So the blowing of the shofar, supernatural things happen. Glory to God. So um, again, Isaac is a type of a foreshadowing of Christ. Amen. All right? So it's, it, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, it says, uh, By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall, the seed, shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. This is how Abraham believed. From whence also he received him in a figure. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So you, you can see when it comes to Isaac, when it comes, when it comes to Jesus, um, the way how they came about was miraculous. Amen. All right? And, the, and you know what? They were both obedient to the point of sacrifice. So there's a connection there. All right? So Isaac is a type of Christ in, in this aspect. And you'll see that when you, when you begin to understand the types that God has in the, in, in the Bible, and particularly the Old Testament, you see he's telling a story. He's constantly, constantly telling a story. And, it's to, and, and when, you, when you see the patterns, when you see, you, you, you see it's all pointing to Christ. That's why Jesus was able to say to the disciples when he rose again from the dead, when he walked on the road to Emmaus, he could tell the, the two disciples um, that was discouraged, despondent, um, and he opened up the scriptures to them, beginning from, um, the, from the book of Moses, the Psalms, the writings, the prophets. And he just, he just opened up the scriptures and says, look, it's all about me, Jesus. Amen. And they didn't know it was Jesus until when they got to a house and they broke bread. And then their eyes were open and they realized, whoa, Jesus himself has been talking to us all along. Uh, you know, that's when, you know, when, when they uh, realized that. But hallelujah. Glory to God. So um, one of the um, revelations concerning um, the Feast of Trumpets, and it has several, uh, is about a wedding. It's also about the crowning of a king. It's also about repentance. It's, it's, it has several things. Um, so one of them is about a wedding. And you're familiar with this scripture verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Let, let, let me read it. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, Amen. with the voice of the archangel. Now listen to this, with the what? The trump of God. Yeah. All right? And, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. It, the trump is going to be so powerful it can wake the dead. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Then, I, I mean, if we just pause for a moment there, just, if you just keep your finger there for a moment. When this happens, saints, the whole world is going to know that something has happened. No one will be able to sleep through this. If, it, if it's so powerful to wake the dead, I, I mean, just, just to think about it. I, I think once, this is just my thoughts, that when that day happens, there's going to be like earthquakes in the earth because people, you know, people's spirits are going to be rejoined back to their bodies. The bodies are going to be re knitted back together, and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And, and they're going to be coming out of the graves. This is not going to be quiet. It's not going to be silent. It's going to be, it's going to be noisy. There's going to be a commotion. Something's going to happen. People are not going to know something's happened. Not only will they hear the sound of the trumpet blowing, but also there'll be, you know, people coming out of the graves. It's, it, it's you know, so, so back, back, back to the verse. It says, it says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So it's interesting how the, the Jewish religious people know that this Feast of Trumpets has something to do with the, with the Messiah coming and getting and, and a marriage and all that sort of stuff, which, 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 is, is, which is amazing, right? Yes. Glory to God. So it is, you know, so again, just, just consider this. Um, my personal feeling, I think we need to be on watch. But Bible calls us to be watchmen, right? Amen. And um, I, th I think throughout these, any, anytime you see a biblical feast coming up, you should always be on watch. You should be just be alert and, and, and aware, right? So, so that you never get caught off guard, all right? Just, just watch this, you know, let's, let's see what the Lord may do because it's possible that at, at uh, this Rosh Hashanah, some future uh, Feast of Trumpets, that um, this will be fulfilled when the Messiah comes in the clouds. 
for his church, for his bride. Okay? And the dead in Christ will rise first into the air. We'll be, you know, and those who are alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. Hallelujah. It's also believed, the Jewish, Jewish people believe, is that's the time when people's names are written in the book of life. Amen. All right? Interesting. And they also believe, too, that um, on the day of uh, Feast of Trumpets, um, uh, decisions will be made. You know, God's making his final decisions, but you got 10 days to uh, kind of like get your act together to repent before it's finalized. You know, and so therefore those 10 days between uh, Feast of Trumpets and, and the Day of Atonement, it's called the Days of Awe. All right? So again, it's all part of that. You know, the 30 days plus the 10, 40, a, a, a call to what? Repentance. Call to repentance. Okay? So, um, so the rabbis have taught that after being resurrected on the Feast of Trumpets, the righteous will enter into a kupa. That's a Hebrew word. Okay? And it's spelled C-H-U-P-A-R. Or another word for it is wedding. Okay? Kupa. A wedding. A canopy. Um, to spend seven years while the day of trouble, also known as tribulation, seven years of judgment occurs on the earth. So we know that uh, Christians believe this, but also many of the Jewish rabbis believe this too. And, um, you know, so how, how is that? Well, again, you'll see through the scriptures, like a story is always seems to be being told. And if we take time and we understand what the story, we can see that when you read the parables, you see Jesus was telling that, you know, some certain, not only is, is a parable a story, but he's also telling what God's mind is, what the will of God is, and things like, like, like that. So, for example, when we examine, if you take time to look at uh, um, a Jewish wedding, um, it, it, you can see, if you take a look at it, all that, you can see it's an example of when Christ marries his bride. All right? Um, what, what used to happen in biblical times is that a, a man in ancient Israel, when he wants to marry a woman, uh, he would bring a bride's price, like a, a, a dowry, if you want to call it that, and make a, a contract, a covenant with the girl's father. So if he wants, you know, you know it's not like today. <laughs> You know, you see a woman you want to marry, you talk to her, you know, and all that. No, you, you, those days they'd go to the father first and talk to the father because they can't marry the daughter unless the father says so, right, in those days. So um, if the father accepted the man and he was in agreement and he, and, and he accepted the bride's price, uh, the, the, the man, the father, would, would, would pour a glass of wine, okay? And if the... If the so, sorry, when, 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 when I said the man, the, the one who wants to get married will pour a glass of wine, right? And, and, and the, if the woman, the girl, the young woman, uh, drank it, it indicated that she accepted the man's proposal. Amen. All right? And they were now betrothed. In other words, they entered into a contract. You're going to be my wife, I'm your, and I'm going to be your husband. All right? And um, then... Once all that has been done, the man would uh, go away and prepare a wedding chamber for his bride. Isn't that amazing? Well, what do we see in John chapter 14? Does Jesus do something similar? Absolutely. You see, because you, you find that the words Jesus speaks all throughout the New Testament, he's speaking to their culture. He, he's speaking language that they ought to understand. Right? We may not because we don't come from that culture, a Jewish culture, right? But listen, 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 listen to the words that Jesus spoke on the night before he was crucified to, the, to, to his disciples. And, and, and when you read this and you understand it, you can see that these are words of betrothal. All right? He, right? You know, remember, he's at Last Supper, he's drank, they've eaten the unleavened bread, they've drank wine. It's a covenant relationship. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body that was broken for you and 
you know, drink, this is my blood that was shed for you, right? It, it was all symbolic, but yet it wasn't. It's more than that because he was going to actually fulfill it the next day. He says, uh, verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are what? Many mansions. That's exactly what, you know, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That right off the bat should have said to the Jewish people, he's talking marriage. They understood this language, right? Because that's what, what happened. Once a man entered into a, a, an agreement, a contract with a woman to get married with the father's approval, he would go away for one to two years. Wow. On the average, one to two years, saints, to prepare a place. All right? Okay? He says, I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Glory to God. So, so, so back in the times of Jesus, when a man entered into a, a covenant marriage relationship to betroth a, a woman, he'd go away for, on the average, a year to two years. Well, I like the word, the, the, the two years, because, you know, to me, that's like 2,000 years. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's the 2,000 years is gone now. Come and go for this. Jesus went back to heaven. So it's like the, the two days is up. The, you know, the, the, the time period is up. So any, anytime he's going to be showing up. Right? He will come back. And, and you, you know, because he said, I'm, I'm, I'm in my father's house, there's many mansions. If it was not so, I would tell you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. And this is what a typical Jewish man would do once he's entered into that, that betrothal contract with the woman. He'd go off. And prepare a place all right for his uh, for his future bride and he would return to the house to steal her away when they least expected it when the bride least expected it so she all she had to remain in a ready state yes. okay you, you know so she, she he would return to like steal away like a like 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 a thief in the night Jesus is not a thief and not the bridegroom is a thief, but you know what, how, what a thief is like? He surprises. Isn't that what he does? Yeah. Right? When somebody goes to, when a, a, an effective thief always has the element of surprise. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus is not a thief. And we have a church here in the city called the, the Church of the Good Thief. Good thief. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of, okay. Or oh, we used to, I should say. Yeah. Um, but when we first moved to the city, we found out that a church was called the Church of the Good Thief. Like, well, what kind of name is that? But nevertheless, Jesus is not a thief. But the scripture does tell us, Paul the Apostle says that when he shows up, he will be like a thief for those who are not prepared. Mm -hmm. And for those, and therefore he says in Thessalonians, he says, you're not of the night. So this should not take you by surprise. You should be aware of the season and time. So if, if you were living back in those days and you were a woman... Uh, you know, when a, when a year has come and gone, you, you'll say, you know what, I got 12 months to go, max. Six months, and 18 months ago, I got about approximately six more months left. If she doesn't have a, you know, she needs to be ready. Because he's going to show up at any time. Right? But the average was around a year to two years. Right? And likewise, we as a church, we have to be in a ready state too. Similar. When we understand this, we, we see why we have to be in a ready state. Right? Okay, and so, 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 so the groom would show up at an hour when no one would suspect. You know, they weren't expecting it, right? Uh, so, and he would take her away to his wedding chamber. Yes, yes. that's the way it was, Amen. right? But he would not come for his bride until his father says it's okay to go. Mm -hmm. His father would check out the home, the house, and see if it's suitable for him, to, uh, for him and his, for his son to have a, a bride there and all that, make sure everything is in order first. Amen. A good father would do that. Well, God the Father is the same. He wants to make sure everything is in order first. So, if, you know, and Jesus, all this time, he's been preparing a place for you and myself, according to John chapter 14. Isn't that amazing? Praise the Lord. That's how much he loves us. Yes. That, that's kind of cool. Praise that God. he would spend time preparing, as you heard me say before, which is true. Heaven is a, a place, a prepared place for those who've prepared themselves. Nobody arrives in heaven by chance. Sure. All right? Amen? Amen. You've got to be prepared. All right? Um, hallelujah. Oh. Hallelujah. So, um, 
So the groom would take his bride into the bridal chamber for seven days. And in the meantime, the father would hold a party and announce the marriage to all the guests. At the end of the seventh day, the married couple would, would emerge from the chamber and partake of the marriage supper. Do we see similar in the scriptures? Absolutely. Um, you, let's just touch on a, few, on a couple. Isaiah chapter 26, we go there with me for a moment. Isaiah chapter 26. We see here um, in verse 20 and 21, what, what, what do we see here? We see um, the word of God saying, Come my people, enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is, is be overpassed. This is prophetic. Yeah. This is prophetic. God, God, God is saying, I'm going to, I'm, he, he, he's telling us, he's calling to his people to enter into the chamber. There come a time when God's, Jesus will come and get his bride and he'll enter into the bridal chamber with his bride. Yeah. Just like the man in the Bible days would with his new bride. He would go into the bridal chamber with his bride for seven days. Yeah. But this is going to be for seven years. Yeah. During the seven years is when uh, the Bible calls it Jacob's trouble or great tribulation, it's going to be tribulation times, it's going to be the day of the Lord, it's, it's going to be a difficult time down here on planet earth. Yeah. You know, that's when God's going to be pouring out his judgment, yeah. and his goal is to get rid of sin, sinners, and everything else that goes with it. Yeah. He's cleaning up for when his son returns with his bride to reign on planet earth for a thousand years. Yeah. He's got to clean it up before his son arrives. So, so in the next verse, verse 21 says, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. During these seven years when Jesus is with his bride in the bridal chamber, it's going to be awful down here. You don't want to be part of that. The earth also shall, be dis shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Judgment time. Right? This is the prophetic side of all this. But the, but the practices of the Jewish weddings was playing out all the time, telling the story the, of the bigger story of what God the Father is going to do with his son. Okay, of his plans, his son. He, God has, a, you know, you, you see from, from Genesis all the way through, God always wanted to have a wife for his son. Yeah. You know, I don't want to digress, but even for a moment, a Abraham, there came a time when he said, I've got to get a wife for my son Isaac. What does he do? He sends his, his servant out to go get a wife for his servant. Does, does, does he not? Yes. And what was his servant's name? Eliza? Eliza. Eliza, right? Okay. We won't go down this road right now, but he was a type of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because he went off, and I, I trust you know the story, and he went off to find a wife for Isaac. And what happened? He found a wife and he brought her back mm -hmm. to Isaac. Mm -hmm. Did he not? Yeah. The Holy Spirit is on planet Earth right now. He's living in us, through in us. It's a time for us to purify ourselves, to get ourselves ready and prepared or whatever. There'll come a time when the Holy Spirit will, boom, take us out yeah. and present yeah. us yeah. to yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Amen. You, you see, the story is being told. Yeah. All right? Right? If, 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 if you can see that. Okay? And um, so the ancient Jewish wedding is a picture of Jesus, the bridegroom, and the bride, the church. Put together. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Even when, um, when Jesus sat at the, with his disciples having the Last Supper, we see in Mark chapter 14, verse 24. Um, the, he, he's entering the, a covenant contract, a betrothal with them. Mm -hmm. he, you know, um, he, you know, because uh, the, the covenant was sealed mm -hmm. at the Last Supper. Yeah. Like, um, like a man who was getting engaged to the woman, it's sealed when she accepts that, 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 that cup of wine. Yes. She's entering that agreement. Mm -hmm. The contract is signed 
and it's sealed by that. So when, when Jesus um, said, um, and he said unto them in Mark chapter 14, verse 24, he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Mm -hmm. what, what's he doing? He's entering a covenant, yeah. right? Yeah. Now we're engaged. Amen. Amen. I mean, the, the, the bride is now engaged to the groom, which is yeah. the son of God. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Again, we see uh, many scriptures pointing to this, telling the same, the same story, but just adding more light to it. We see in, in Revelation chapter 19, uh, we can read a few verses there, a couple of verses there. And what's, what's interesting about this in Revelation 19, it's at the end of the book of Revelation. Right? And if you know anything about the book of Revelation, when it comes to chapter 19, um, the, seven the seven years of tribulation is pretty well over. Are you, are you seeing this? Yes. So what happens at the end of, of the tribulation or close to the end of it, we see here in chapter 19, verse 7 and 8, we, we, we see the marriage lamb supper. Yes. That's what we see. And you, you see, so again, back to the Jewish ancient wedding, that after the bride and groom has spent seven days in the bridal chamber, they'll come out and they'll have a marriage supper. You know, seven days later. Praise the Lord. Are you seeing it? At the end of the seven days, they'll have a marriage. It's not at the beginning. You know, we, when we get married in this culture, what we do, we sit down and eat at the very beginning, do we Amen. not? <laughs> Complete reversal, yeah. right? Complete reversal, right? In this culture, right? So in, in, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, it says, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Verse 7 says, uh, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Praise God. Oh, glory to God. Praise God. Hallelujah. So we can see that the Jewish wedding... It is, it, the Jewish wedding ceremony, I should say, is another way to show uh, the, how beautiful the, 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 the shadow of Christ's return is. Like, you know, it's all there. It, you know, again, we see the shadows, the types, um, all that. I, again, we, if, if you go with me again with Jeremiah chapter 8, we remember we were talking earlier on that during the Feast of uh, Trumpets and Feast of Day of Atonement, uh, it's called the Days of Awe, right? Yeah. Well, we, we could, we could you, know, you know, I believe prophetically you will see this play out when, it, when that time does come, because it says here in Jeremiah chapter 8, in verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. In other words, there's been an ingathering, the harvest has come in, you know, if somebody read this from a natural point of view and say, okay, the fruit is coming at the end of the summer. That's when all the fruit is gathered, right? But also, we also know that God is in, is in the farming business. He's, he was the first farmer. He's a, you know, he's a husbandman, as the scripture talks about. Yeah. And, and, in other words, and he wants a harvest too. Yeah. So it was, you know, just might, it would seem to me that the scripture is implying that the ideal time for God to gather his harvest is at the end of the summer, right? And it says here, I am... Verse 20 says, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. So should this occur on a future feast of trumpets, you will see from heaven, immediately the Jewish people will go into a time of mourning. Yeah, true. Right? Not only would they go into a type of mourning, guess how, who else is going to be going to mourning? Backsliders. Right? Yeah. They'll go into mourning. It, it's not going to be nice. Right? For those who were who uh, uh, left behind when they could have partook or they heard the truth and they knew the truth and they didn't prepare themselves. So, Feast of Trumpets, it's an exciting time coming up. And this is just one of, we just looked at one of the shadow, shadow types of this particular feast. There's the crowning of the, of the king. Right? There's repentance. There's um, different things that this feast talks about, but um, this is one main one that I believe all Christians 
should be aware of and, and just be alert that don't let this feast come and go and you're caught off guard. Because if the Lord decides to show up for his church at this time of the year or any future feast or trumpet, uh, you don't want to be caught off guard. He's fulfilled the first four. Amen? Amen. And what's interesting, I find, um, and we may, we may come back to this, it's called the, a day of memorial for blowing trumpets. I wonder, this is just me thinking out loud, if one of these days, once this happens, should it happen on a day like the Feast of Trumpets, uh, in the future people will always be looking back at, that was the day when the church was raptured. That was the day when uh, people were taken out of the earth. You know, and you know how we celebrate Pentecost, right? We know as the day when God poured His Spirit upon the saints, hallelujah, then in the future this may very well become a day when people remember and celebrate the day when God took the righteous out of the earth. Isn't is, is that amazing? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Now, some people may not like what I'm about to say, but if you were, you know the book of Ezra? You might remember him? There's, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's the book of Ezra. Well, well there's another book called Ezra 2. It's not part of the canon of the 66 books. But in that second book of Ezra, the same individual that wrote uh, the book of Ezra, in one of the chapters, I believe it's chapter 6, he, he talks about there'll come a day when men will point at individuals and say, I'm paraphrasing all this, that's one of them that got, I'm paraphrasing this in my own words, that got, that was caught up to heaven and did not die a natural death and came back in their glorified bodies. And what's interesting, back then, which was hundreds of thousands of years ago when Ezra was alive, God was revealing these truths to him. And it's just amazing. So a day will come, saints, when all this is said and done. That natural man that's left on planet Earth will say that's one of them that did not die a natural death. That's one of them that got caught up and they're full of light. It's going to be glorious. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, saints. Saints, we have a glorious future ahead of us. And um, I'm not saying it's going to happen this Feast of Trumpets. But some future Feast of Trumpets, it could very well happen. Hallelujah. So, be alert. Be on watch. And um, don't get caught off guard. Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. And if the, glory to God. And if the Lord chooses not to come at this time, that's fine. We're just going to stay in a state of expectation because the 2,000 years is up. Amen? Amen? We'll just stay in a state of expectation. Amen? Praise God. Glory to God. Praise I know some people when they thought, well, Jesus is coming at this time and that time and, then, and he didn't show up, they get all discouraged and they throw, throw the towel in, so to speak, and they walk away from the things of God. That shouldn't be you. No. You should be saying, I'm, gonna, I'm committed all the way, whether you show up or not, Amen. when you show up, when I think you're going to show up. But remember, he's going to show up when we all least think that he's not going to. Amen. 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 <laughs> Praise God. And that's what happened to the ten virgins, right? The bridegroom showed up when they were not expecting, but yet they should have been expecting him. Yes? Glory to God. Five of wise. Let's be of the wise. Amen? Amen? Amen. We're expecting him to show up. Yes. Some others are not expecting him to show up. So because they're not expecting him to show up, they're not going to take steps to prepare. All right? But those who are expecting him will take steps to prepare and maintain a ready state. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and we're going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity that uh, we can learn more about the things of God. We thank you for opening up your word to us tonight and let us know that the Feast of Trumpet has something to do with uh, a wedding, the wedding of the King, the crowning of the Messiah, a coronation, repentance, all of these, preparation. And I, I just pray, Lord, that you would take the truth that we've heard tonight and cause it to sink deep into the hearts of your people. And I pray when the time comes for you for the church, 
whenever that, com whenever that time comes, at the appointed time, every one of us will be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon this earth and to stand before the Son of God with joy, with confidence, with peace. Oh, hallelujah, with great joy. Hallelujah. I give you the glory and I give you the praise. And I pray everyone that, that will hear this Bible study tonight, um, that you that will be their portion. Amen. That every one of us will escape what's coming. Amen. Oh, we give you the glory, we give you the praise, and stand before Jesus. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.